Thank you so much, and thanks to all of you who took your time today to come and learn new exciting things. We're so appreciative to have you here, and it's such an honor to get to share this time with you. I was trying and trying to come up with a speech, and it just was not coming together, and it finally hit me. Oh my gosh, just tell the story. You have this story to tell, just tell it straight from the heart. So I have a little cheat sheet here um, if, I, if I forget a line or two, but basically I'm just going to be sharing with you a story as it happened to me, as it evolved. And it starts about 15 years ago. I decided I was going to go back to school. I was going to go to law school. I was 35. Um, time for career change, I felt, and um, so yes, I'll help you with the math. That makes me 50 now. So, um, and I will say it's maybe not recommendable to go back to law school when you're 35 because I was in with a lot of young whippersnappers who were 21, staying up all night studying, and I was just hanging on for dear life. But I, I knew that I wanted to do something to make an impact, to help change lives for the better. But I wasn't sure exactly what, and I felt like, well, a law degree would probably help me do that. And I would probably go into some type of defense work. I wanted to help animals and children. Um, but it all came together for me, sitting in criminal law class. I'll never forget the day. And the criminal law professor, just very casually, was, was uh, lecturing and teaching. And she said, within the legal arena, we refer to especially heinous or violent crimes as depraved heart crimes, depraved heart. And in fact, judges will look at depravity of heart for sentencing guidelines, just very matter of fact. And it hit me, and really my world stopped that day because I realized, aha, we even have terminology for it. We know that crime is related to issues of the heart the heart, but we're really not doing anything about it, huh? So everything for me began to, to hone in and focus on this subject, and I began to do all of my legal research that was required for graduation around this topic of depravity of heart and criminal law. And what I found out was astounding, that through the literature research I did, I discovered that almost every violent offender had two things in common. They were abused as children, and they began repeating abuse on vulnerable others, namely animals, while they were still children. They began repeating and acting out that which was familiar to them, which was abuse. And that really, really hit me. And I wasn't quite satisfied there. I wanted to find out for myself, hands-on, do my own research. And so I visited the incarceration facilities in our area. And I would go to the warden and I would say, I'm doing this research for law school and I want to talk to your most violent offenders you have incarcerated here, the murderers, the rapists. And I can remember that like it was yesterday too. They would take me inside of the prison and all of the doors locking behind me, walking down the narrow hallways. and they would put me in a small room to wait. They called it a chapel. And I could hear every inmate coming to me down the hall because they had chains around their wrist, connected to their waist, and attached to their ankles. And so every step that they took, you could hear the chains rattling. And they would sit in front of me, they would sit before me, and we would just chat quietly for a few moments. And I realized, at one point in time, this person was seven or eight or nine. They were a child. What happened? And every one of them, every one of them had the same story. They were abused or severely neglected as a child, and they abused animals. And when I would ask them, well, how did you feel when you would hurt this animal? Did it make you feel sad? They all had the same answer, no, I didn't feel sad. I felt a sense of relief, of release, like I had overpowered my environment. And it hit me then, aha, our missing link is compassion. These children are not having it demonstrated to them in their homes for whatever reasons. We don't have a class on it in school. How do we expect 
these children to grow up understanding and, and fulfilling compassion. And so thus was the beginning seed of the healing species. What is the healing species? I'll tell you quickly and then I have a brief video to show you because sometimes that's better. But the healing species is a compassion education curriculum. We go into the schools, we reach the kids for about 13 weeks, we go back to them every week, once a week for a classroom period, and we bring with us these lessons that are written out, they're published, and we teach basic life skills. And all along the way, we're building and teaching compassion. Well, what better way to bring that to life, literally, than to bring with us a rescued dog? a dog that nobody else wanted, a dog that had been given up on, and we will bring the dog with us into the classroom. Well, that changes the whole chemistry in the classroom. The kids are suddenly excited about what you have to say. They're curious, and it's so funny. They'll forget our names, but they never forget the names of the visiting dog. And they just are so curious, and we say, this is a dog nobody had any value on. This is a dog everybody had given up on. This is a dog that people had kicked at and said, get. But somewhere along the way, he found a little bit of hope, and here he is today. And look, he has a job, he's important, he's valuable, just like you. But some, oftentimes seeing is, is believing, so I'm going to show a brief clip, a video clip, that if we have that ready, you can take a look and see what we do in the classroom with the video. They don't call them man's best friend for no reason, and we found a couple of dogs really living up to their name. They're lending a paw, you could say, to kids across the Midlands. And our own Clark Foraker spent the day with these special pups. And Clark, these dogs obviously working very hard. Yeah, that's right, Andrea. These dogs really are something special. They're working hard entering elementary school classrooms across the Midlands with a silent language that's speaking the world to kids. Some students think abuse is normal. It's just normal life. It's what they've seen. It's what they've experienced. And when we bring it out in the open, in a classroom setting, they realize, aha, this may not be normal what has happened to me. For the shortest teacher wandering the halls of Mellichamp Elementary in Orangeburg, it was the norm. Bo literally, truly was dumped on the side of the road. Sherry Thompson was driving when she saw the black pup. She couldn't help but stop. He was famished, he was emaciated, he had intestinal worms. Little by little, we just brought him back to help. Bo is one of 12 in the Thompson household. Now healthy, he earns his keep in the classroom. The dog is really the magical component in the classroom. The dog can break down barriers in the classroom that a human cannot. We've seen it in many pet therapy settings where the dog can help a child be able to release and to be comfortable to share things that have happened to them. They Adele Little runs The Healing Species, a nonprofit taking dogs with violent pasts into classrooms to sniff out students with similar stories. Since they started 11 years ago, they've spoken to more than 22,000 students across the Midlands. The group encourages students to speak out if they've been abused or bullied. There's three steps to keeping your heart. Lessons on keeping your heart emphasize grieving and forgiving in an effort to gain self-control. They never make it right. If an animal has control like that, certainly our students can, can have control too. So it teaches our students that no one is above the ability to learn, to improve, and to have self-control. Principal Hayward John says, all his students have been hurt in some way and needs all paws on deck. Those paws come from this dog sanctuary, opened by the foundation when people started dropping off strays. Some used in the program, others brought back to health and adopted. If we can get them now at this elementary level, we won't need intervention at the middle and high school level. Angela Burroughs does assign all the students know. It's the quiet way to say hello in the halls. She says the interactions they have with each other address emotional needs many of her students have. When our children have the tools that Healing Species provides for dealing with anger or a bad life experience or a bad circumstance they may be going through, then they're not out of the classroom being disciplined. Tell a trusted adult. Studies show that means grades and test scores go up while the need for discipline goes down. Out of school suspensions declining 55% for students in the program. Specifically, if someone hurts you. School workers say that's a result of students choosing empathy instead of aggression. 
anybody can pick on somebody. That's the easy thing to do. The harder thing to do is to walk away. And walk toward a new way that doesn't say much but gives a whole lot, just like the teacher who taught it. Obviously a group doing some really great work there. If you'd like more information about how to help the healing species or adopt one of their dogs, just head to WLTX.com and click on this story. I've got all the information you'll need at the bottom of the page. JR? All right, uh, Clark, thank you so much. This was a dog nobody loved, everyone had given up on, nobody wanted. Many of the dogs are in horrible shape when we find them. They are starving, they are uh, covered with mange and other diseases, they usually have um, terrible infestation of intestinal worms. And so this is a dog that would not stand a chance of getting a second chance if they didn't come by way of the healing species. We bring them here to the sanctuary and we rehabilitate the dogs, and then the, if they have the right right temperament for it, they get to go into the classroom. But we believe that every life is precious and that every life has value. And we translate that to each and every individual child as well. If bad things have been done to you, just like this dog, if you keep your heart, you can go forth and make a difference and make things better for others as well as yourself. And that's sort of really the, the nutshell of what we do. And, and these dogs help bring it all to life. Now all of the dogs here are also available for adoption. Um, our goal is to place every one of these dogs into a loving home and there's never a shortage of dogs. There's a waiting list right now of people just begging us, please, can you go get this dog or that dog that we saw? And because we are no-kill, we do get filled to over capacity. Right now we have more dogs than we should really. Every dog needs a home in their own space, in their own love, in their own yard, so that's what we try to make happen for each and every one of them. Okay, so one of the dogs that you saw in the video is a dog named Gravy, and I'm going to show you sort of the before and afters of her in just a moment. But let me just back up and tell you briefly a little bit about the curriculum itself. Um, as I mentioned to you, it is written, it's published. There are lessons that each of our instructors follow along with. Um, the really neat thing about the program, though, is that it literally does change lives. The reporter there mentioned that, yes, statistics have been done on the program, um, Out-of-school suspensions do go down by about 55% among the kids who get the program. Acts of aggression decreases by over 62%. Acts of empathy increase by over 42%. So we really are seeing lives change. But aside from those studies are the anecdotal stories that we come in contact with day in and day out. Um, Part of what the lessons do is, number one, we begin by teaching the child that they deserve to be safe, that it is not okay if they are being hurt. We explain to them in an age-appropriate way that if anyone is touching you where you wear a bathing suit on your body, that is not okay, and you have to tell a trusted adult. And if that first adult that you tell does not believe you or does not want to help you, you keep telling because you have a voice and it deserves to be heard. But then we move from not only personal safety for the child, we also teach if you're turning black and blue and purple and green from discipline, that's not okay either. In many cases, we do intervene on behalf of the child. We have called in social services before. We've worked closely with guidance counselors. Um, we've worked closely with parents. In fact, I'll tell you a quick story of a little girl just last year, which every year, we have students come forward. After they are empowered with these messages, they come forward and say, I do need help. This is happening. Um, so it's very freeing and empowering for them. But just one story from last year, a little girl, um, this was fifth grade, I believe. She was living with her grandmother. I'm sure the grandmother loved her very much, but she was older. She was a single adult trying to raise this child, and every weekend an older cousin from out of town would come and stay in the home. Well, this older cousin was abusing the little girl, and the little girl didn't really know. She felt like it was probably wrong, but she wasn't certain. But this empowered her to speak up and ask for help. And we worked with the grandmother and the little girl reports that it's never ever happened again. So we do empower the children that they have the right to be safe, but the really neat thing is that also we take them by week 13 when we're wrapping up, they do a service project and they have to do something to help someone else. And what they learn is that no matter who they are, what their start is in life, that they have something to contribute and they really can change the world. 
They really can make a difference. This is Gravy when I first saw her, when I first found her, and here she is getting veterinary care. There she is today, and she still lives with us today. Um, this, we tell the story of Gravy to all of the children, and that's one of the first things we tell in Lesson 1, because when I first saw Gravy, she was on the side of the road, and she was living in a neighborhood that has houses. Now, granted, it was somewhat rural, but there were people around. And so when I first saw her, I pulled over, I stopped the car, I began to cry inconsolably. I had to just stop for a few moments. And then I started talking to the dog, and I said, I named her right off the spot, Gravy. Um, <laughs> Gravy, I'm going to help you. I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'm going to do something. And um, so I had a Pop-Tart in my car. And I said, ha, I'll feed her this Pop-Tart. She'll come to me. I'll take her home. It'll all be good. Well, she was having no part of it. She would not get within a foot of me. So I had to throw the Pop-Tart on the ground and step away from it. And then I had to go stop what I was doing. This is when I was in law school. It's a wonder I didn't fail out because I was doing these kind of things all along. And um, I came back with canned dog food. And I thought the smell would get her for sure. Well, no, she, she, I had to put the food on the ground and step away from it, and then she would come eat it. And this went on for about a month. Every day I'd go feed gravy. And on one of these occasions, the people who lived there rode past, and they waved at me, and they recognized me from feeding this dog. And what we tell our kids is that they could see gravy with their eyes, but they couldn't see gravy with their heart and there was a little tiny piece of their heart that was broken. But if we can stop it there, and we can all see with our heart, and not just our eyes, then yes, indeed, we will begin to change this world. And these children are empowered to do just that. And so, this is us in the classroom, taking the rescue dogs with us, working with the kids. The kids love it. And like I said, the dogs are famous, and um, they forget all about us. But this, <laughs> this is a drawing of what one of the students um, drew for us after we were finished. And I don't think you can read it, but the caption at the bottom says, what I learned from Gravy is that if you see something wrong, do something about it. And if we can empower all of our young people to truly believe that, Together, we truly will change this world. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you.